Biden. Yesterday, we teased a BBC Eye investigative documentary, which revealed testimonies from dozens of alleged survivors of atrocities and sex crimes linked to late pastor T.B. Joshua of the Synagogue Church of All Nations, one of the world's biggest evangelical churches. The pastor, who died on June 5th, 2021, was said to have secretly committed sexual crimes on a mass scale, abusing and raping young women from around the world several times a week for nearly 20 years. According to the BBC, the documentary was completed after a two-year investigation in collaboration with international media platform Open Democracy and involved more than 15 BBC journalists across three continents. They gathered archive video recordings, documents, and hundreds of hours of interviews to uncover the harrowing stories. The three-part documentary, which was released on January 8th, has since gone viral with millions of views on the internet. Well, let's take a look at a short clip of the documentary before we come back for a discussion. At that time, when they see anybody sleeping, that person will be in trouble. There would be times that I'd be falling asleep like this and he would say, stand up. And you literally have to stand up and then at times I would fall asleep while standing. Somebody was so tired, he slept, opened his mouth. T.B. Joshua led four boys. They pee inside his mouth. Fasting and lack of sleep took place before disciples' deliverances. Psychologically destroying us to the point that I will do whatever you say. You become almost like a zombie. I didn't know I was joining a cult. I thought I was joining a church. He was building the church itself. In these constructions we are going on fast. It's like his dream. Something that can beat the Gothic temples in Europe. Everybody worked to build this massive structure. TB Joshua was trying to create his own empire. Behind the scenes, you've got a workforce with no pay. We were a machine around him. He wouldn't have been able to do it without all the disciples. We lay flat on the floor. My skirt was lifted up and I was just naked. He hit me with that or sweep. We actually lie down on the floor. He would use it. Bah, bah. We have blood. He beat you without mercy. He started having massive events for people that had got disabilities, wheelchair-bound people. He'd give them rice, he'd give them food. And there was like this massive show of generosity. His shield was his message. This mass outworking of charity to cover who he really was. I stared myself in the mirror a lot of the times, and maybe I do look like him, maybe. For as long as I can remember, I have been raised as T.B. Joshua's daughter. Ajoke grew inside the synagogue, like an outcast. But talking about years and years of abuse, consistent abuse, abuse that wasn't ending. He hated her and he punished her for being born. Her existence was probably the biggest threat to his reputation. We went into his room and I stood there and he said, off your clothes. So I, I, I removed my clothes and then he just pointed. So I lied down and then he raped me. He broke my virginity. When he come back from the service, he kept forcing him, himself on me. He assured me God was not upset. The more I made him happy, God will be happy with me. He grabbed me and he held me very close to him and he he literally then pushed me down to the bed and he got on me. I was still so shocked. I was still bleeding. He spit on the floor and he held my hands and he looked straight into my eyes and said, I can see you are my child now. Don't betray me. He designed a system for deceiving all of us disciples. A lot of women were being abused by this man. I had no idea. I thought I was the only one. I didn't know 
that that thing had happened to anybody else. No fewer than 50 persons have yet killed following the collapse. My daughter died in a place where I thought it's safe. All right, I was up all night watching this documentary, three hours long, very, very detailed. But you know, this uh, will obviously raise a lot of eyebrows because it came out after his death. That last footage there was in 2014 when the guest house collapsed and killed over, I believe over a hundred people died. And most of them were foreigners. And that lady is still talking about compensation at this point. But let me take some um, tweets or one tweet, this is from Salt of Life, who wrote, whether TB Joshua is guilty of the things he's being accused of or not, every African should question why the BBC would do a documentary on an African pastor, yet not do the same for a European American billionaire who had a whole island as a hunting ground for pedophiles. We are yet to even see or hear a documentary about the alleged atrocities of the royal family as alleged by the late Princess Diana. Why should the BBC write or narrate African stories? I mean, I believe this was BBC Africa. That's a response to uh, SALT. This is an African um, part of the BBC that did this uh, detailed investigation. But also what got me was the fact um, was the rape accusations. You know I'm very sensitive about these types of things. And these women came out talking about the fact that they lived with him for years, some 12, some 14, 15 years, and they witnessed this sort of you know, abuse. And you saw his uh, alleged daughter, uh, her name is Ajoke, and she talked about the fact that she was also abused in that church for years. At this point, we are not sure, you know, whether or not the family, the current family, have adopted a joker. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, that's not even on, on, the, um, on the radar because the church has also not responded to the BBC. They have, I mean, the church leader is the wife of TB Joshua at this point, have not responded to the documentary because they say this is not a new allegation. This has been going on for years. And TB Joshua's style is not to respond to accusations. Ayo. All right. So uh, I also started watching the documentary yesterday. I couldn't finish. I, I finished. I hope to do so. There's so many angles, uh, Oji, and mm. it's very disheartening when you hear the stories of people, real people who were interviewed, not masked, people who were willing to come out. I'll address a few things. The first is around whether the BBC had legitimacy or the right to investigate because, um, you know, it's an African issue. I think it's an indictment on our own uh, investigative journalism, if we say that, because... We ought to agree, yes, we tell our own stories, but I don't think it takes away the import of what they have revealed. And if they decide to take them, when, we, when they did sex for marks, we didn't mm -hmm. say it wasn't their business. When it um, changed legislature in the universities, we didn't say it was their business. So I know that when it comes to religion, it's very sensitive. However, we must come to a place where we are honest with ourselves. And I often, I, I will always proudly say that I'm a member of the constituency of the mm, church because right. I'm a Christian. So this is very sad for me to watch it play out. Let me say so. I'm not judging because this is an investigative piece. However, the first thing I would say is this. Prophet T.B. Joshua is not the first Christian to be, um, to have, for allegations to come out after his death. There was a famous preacher called Ravi Zacharias who died in 2020. And following his death, there were allegations of sexual misconduct by some women. What the church did was that they investigated. So they didn't just throw it away and say, we're yes, not going to respond this to this. Is the issue. They investigated and they found that it was actually true. And so what they did was that they apologized to these women and then they took out his, you know, his name out of certain things. And there was some form of you know, um, repentance. Yes. That the Christian faith is about repentance. When you find out something is wrong, no one is above mistake. There's no superhuman being on this earth. And so the, talk, the take from what I've heard, I don't, I'm not very impressed by that, that they're just discounting people's experiences without any form of investigation. And the fact that this is not the first time it's coming Absolutely up. Absolutely not. Similar to, you should read the Ravi Zakaria story. Exactly the same thing. There were allegations, but the church had quietened it down and not investigated. But they had the pressure to do so after his death when even more allegations came out and lawyers were defending these women. So I believe that rather than the church coming out and saying, oh, we're going to just an attack 
attack on his integrity. I think it's quite irresponsible to do yes. that. I believe that the, the next line of action in the spirit of protecting, I said it earlier when I was speaking, no human life is more important than another human life. If there are allegations of misconduct, investigate. And yes. even for the sake of the future and for legacy's sake, come out and say that we investigated thoroughly and we found him not guilty, yes. you know, innocent and these people are lying. Then we can be rest assured. Yes. So I don't think it's okay to just bury it and say, oh, let's leave it. Yeah. That's what. Then the second, the final point I'll make is this. When you read about this, sexual misconduct in the church is not new. It's happened over the years, whether in the Catholic Church, whether in Pentecostal, Pentecostalism, in many churches. Unfortunately, what is done is that it's buried. There's a, there are a lot of cult systems that are operating as churches. Let me put it that way. Yeah. There are cults that operate as churches. And we need to uncover this, not just because of its impugning on the integrity of the church, but also the innocent lives that are being destroyed yeah. on a daily basis by this. Jesus came to this world to die for everybody, not more for the pastor than the congregation. Yeah. So we should protect the lives of young people, men, women, boys, girls, if we really love God, yeah. as we say. So I don't stand, I, I don't stand for bearing you know, um, things like this. I think it should be investigated, they should be apologized to, and if, there, if possible, mm -hmm. the church should build a system yeah. where we can prevent such cults from operating yeah. if it does exist. I mean, it does exist. I'm not saying this one until investigation is completed. Yeah. I but totally agree buried. with you, Ayo, and I think mm. that you hit the right notes here. I mean, they are claiming that, you know, previous claims that have been, uh, you know, circulating have been unfounded. But we will say that TB Joshua has passed. And, you know, maybe they want to continue with his legacy of, you know, not addressing issues, whether or not they have addressed issues in the past, like Ayo has said. I think that it is important that they reach out to these women, even at your care, uh, you know, all of these people that have come out now to, you know, expose their pain to the world so that, you know, there's some sort of closure. Uh, Rufai, really quickly. Uh, first, uh, this is a very sad one. And my heart goes out to all of those that told their story. Mm -hmm. I would also say we have to have an independent investigation. Right. And this might not even be led by the church. If the church wants to have accountability, it should lead it. But this might not be led by the church. Government should be involved in this. Because there were many crimes that were committed that also had to do with the government of the day. If my memory serves me right, when that building collapsed in 2014, yes. President Goodluck Jonathan was there. He visited, correct. He visited. Mm -hmm. What was the end result of the investigation of that building collapse? Well, they said that the building lacked integrity. Or, it lacked you know, integrity. It, 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 what were the penalties put in place? That's right. why I say there needs to be holistic. But in all fairness, kudos to the BBC. Mm -hmm. And for the person that sent a tweet, yes, the BBC has a right to do investigation. And let's not be cheeky. Mm -hmm. They have done investigation and reports on the likes of uh, Epstein, yeah. even the royal family. Mm -hmm. If not for a panoramic documentary, we will not see all the fractures in the royal documentary. So, because you have your own personal vendetta against the BBC, do not slam them. I have, yes. when they go wrong, I say it. Yes, but, they do. Mm -hmm. And please do not indict the Nigerian media. I take strong exceptions to that. Do you know the first time I heard of the name TB Joshua? It was in 1996. Through a very investigative journalist called Kola Wali Olawuyi, Nkombe Mewanshelen Duniyo. And you bamo loko, who feel much fancy. Wow, you're Yoruba. So Anybody are the bola, the day bandly. Rufai, Kola Olawi used to have a program on Radio Nigeria on AM right. in Ibado. Saturday morning. He did it on OGBC2 FM stereo Friday, Saturday morning in the Bado. And as of 1996, he did an in-depth investigative report making most of these allegations out about TB Joshua. Kola Olawi was Nigerian, God bless his soul. He had done reports, and there have been many reports out like this. What you will just say is, yes, because of the BBC stature, because they have more influence capital, and the likes of Kola Oyolawi, they were independent journalists, they got it out there. But what is most important is, it's an indictment of us in society that for all these years, we did not have an independent investigation to be able to verify the veracity of all of this story being told. And that's what the church should subject themselves to now, to be able to get all the parts. I mean, we've had people that, like I just stated the case of a pastor, that after their death, they were found guilty, and the church made amendment. So, and that's why I go back to this word. 
Touch not my anointed does not mean the anointed must be stupid. Touch not my anointed means the anointed too must be accountable to God and be responsible. Right. Because we are so quick to say in Christian, don't touch not my anointed. Don't speak evil of a man of God. Cases must be investigated. But men of God too must be careful. The people kept on their, their flock is for them to love and upgrade their lives. You must not hear things like this of my pick, my pick. And for pastors that are doing this, because it's not today. We've had pastors with various spectral candles here and there. Please stop it. You mm. cannot say you serve God and you have a vice and you cannot deal with it. Mm. May God help all of us because we are walking towards perfection. Nobody is perfect. All right. I'm but going this to... can be independently investigated. Very well said, Boom. We're waiting for that investigation. I'm going to run through these stories. I believe you guys have touched, yeah. touched on some of them earlier. We'll take another story following up on the suspension of Dr. Beta Edu, embattled minister of humanitarian affairs and poverty elevation, who on Monday was denied access to see President Bola Ahmed Tinubu at the State House in Abuja. Beta Edu arrived at the presidential villa shortly after her suspension was announced by the presidency. She had passed all security checks, but was blocked from entering the president's office. The suspended minister was subsequently escorted out of the presidential villa by protocol officials and her access tag reportedly redrawn by the president's security team. The president directed the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission to conduct a thorough investigation into all aspects of the financial transaction involving the humanitarian ministry. Uh, we can't take a tweet, but you know, I, I didn't think that this was called for, the way that she was you know, um, escorted out of that uh, presidential villa. We did see that video, I mean, I believe earlier I heard you say that even though that the EFCC is um, investigating yeah. this issue, I think that they should take care in treating people with respect dignity. and dignity. Because also the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission on Monday had detained uh, the former Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Sadia Umar Farouk, for questioning over allegations of corruption in the handling of 37.1 billion social intervention funds during her tenure. The former minister in a post on X confirmed her arrival, stating, I have, at my behest, arrived at the headquarters of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission to honor the invitation by the anti-graft agency to offer clarification in respect of some issues that the commission is investigating. We'll call on that commission to ensure that they investigate this in accordance to the rule of law and not detain them or not harass them the way they have even done with uh, Emefele, who actually was granted a hundred million, million uh, you know, naira for the way that they treated him. But you know, in the meantime, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu also on Monday dismissed the chief executive officer of the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. Babatunde Irukera, and Director General, CEO, Bureau of Public Enterprises, Alex Ayola Oko. Irukera's removal has generated a lot of reactions, as during his tenure, he achieved impressive feats, the most recent being the $110 million fine imposed on British American Tobacco Nigeria for breaching competition laws. The FCCPC had, after an investigation which started in 2020, revealed that BAT Nigeria and its affiliates had engaged in certain anti-competitive conduct and violations of tobacco controls and public health measures. Well, Babatunde Rukara took to social media yesterday, and this was his post. He wrote, grateful for the opportunity to have served the incredibly vibrant and loyal Nigerian citizens and consumers. They deserve a better deal. I leave behind a strong institutional advocate in the FCCPC and an outstanding team of soldiers who work there daily for the cause of fair market. I wonder who would replace Irukera at this point because you know he actually did very well. Yeah. I, a lot of people have talked about the, his removal and yeah. you know are questioning why and we also need to know why yeah. he was removed. We'll take our final story. As we continue our review of budgets in various ministries, let's take a look at this video showing Senator Adam Soshomali grilling the Minister of Works, Dave Umayi, during the Senate screening of the ministry's budget, Oshomali questioned why Umahi, who is an engineer, would allocate a mere 200 million naira for the Benin-Auchi Road, which has become a death trap due to its deplorable state. 
Oshomele also accused Umahi of abandoning his core mandate of road construction and delving into the role of the Federal Road Maintenance Agency. Let's take a look. This budget, this budget has dashed the hope of 200 million Nigerians because none of those roads that we complain about has a location that will enable any contractor other than a tuke tuke to contractors who just want to collect some money you know, and yet Nigerians will worse up. How can you, and I will insist with the permission of the chairman and the co-chair, that you provide an answer as to what you intend to do with 200 million to fix Bini Aochi Road? And how much do you intend to spend per kilometer in that road? So that you can give us a window into how your mind is working that led to this kind of allocation. I emphasize only this, <laughs> but I even see where, when I look at the overall budget, it will appear that the ministry is more interested in maintaining roads rather than concentrating on your core mandate. The maintenance of roads fall within the purview of FEMA. FEMA is charged with the responsibility of maintaining fake roads. So, for example, I saw where you allocated 1.4 million to represent to replace some roads in in about three zones in the south south. And I'm like, there must be a, a, a magician in the Minister of Works under your leadership. How? We can go page by page. Everything here will lead us to the very dirty past. How Nigeria throw money away. Right. I think Ashomele spoke very well here. I mean, 200 million naira on that Benin out you. What do you, what, I mean, how do you say this is a minister of works? I mean, we are calling on Umahi. That road actually, because we've taken this story a couple of times, yeah. that road is deplorable. It needs to be fixed. And I think Ashomele made the point about making sure that we complete roads instead of taking on new roads. Because he also stated during that uh, briefing that Umahi is even adding on state roads instead of concentrating on, on, on federal roads really quickly on this subject. I mean, that's what we call accountability. Yes. And kudos to Oshua. Adam Sushama. Yes. You know, he was the one who that revealed uh, the minister, mm. the female minister that did not know data about yes, her ministry. Yes, it was him. The minister of trade. Yes. So very good one for him. Yes. In fact, he's doing the Lord's work. Yes. Comrade. <laughs> well well done. Done. What's a comrade always a always comrade. A comrade. comrade oh, I, I thought this was such an important story. Yes. We need the, that that particular road is it should be fixed. And also we should find a way to concession roads to the private sector. Because Absolutely. when you see these people that ply these roads, you know we have Dangote, we have Boa, they should try to concession these roads to do. the private sector as well, especially that Algeria. Yeah,